the same uh, two-dimensional plane of, of three-dimensional space, but rather uh, this one is going to produce a wave that hits here and then here and then here and then here uh, in a particular uh, time span, and then this wave is going to hit here and then here and then here and then here in a slightly different time span, mm. and the, the way that it, it moves across the surface, the speed with which it moves across the surface is exactly how you ascertain how far it is away or how close it is. And the, the, speaking of Polynesians, by the way, uh, we were kind of talking about mm -hmm. the Moana earlier today, that's exactly how they ascertain how close they are to land at a given point in time, by looking at the shape of the waves that are before them and understanding that with respect to the boat, this is how close land is. This is Holy how shit. this is how far away some other wave is out from the middle of the ocean. Here's a tsunami coming. This is how they figure that out. I had no idea about that. Yeah, this is this is how that navigation works. So this is exactly what Polynesians do, and you're basically just rediscovering how Polynesians <laughs> <laughs> navigate waveforms. Yes, we just right? we just have a three dimensional bubble rather than a two dimensional craft. That's exactly what it is. So so uh, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head when waves begin to look like this. Yeah, but I can, I, I I can assure that. you that superlinearity occurs on the Earth in smaller bodies of water right. and not at tremendous distances. So it becomes very difficult to, to navigate at great distances in this way. Um, so you'd be constantly reliant on near objects all the time. in order to navigate. At all times. That's exactly what I want. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so, so now... It's, it's landmark navigation. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, so, so, so at some point, so this, this creates uh, a metric space and uh, it naturally induces a metric space in which all of a sudden, um, and, and this is the interesting part. Uh, it was all interesting, John, but whoa, continue. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Touché. <laughs> Bear with me just a moment. Yes, this is the more interesting part. Bear with me just a moment. Yes. We're going to create a metric space in which all of the points of the boundary uh, are are equally close, and and you are perpetually in the in the center here, mm. and there are lots of things that that may uh, be closer or further within some point, but then you have a horizon of effect essentially in terms of superlinearity, which is this phenomenon where a wave becomes effectively flat by the time it reaches you. So this is your horizon of effect. And this is what you can see, essentially, mm, right? Yeah. And everything beyond here is going to be basically yeah. just superlinear waves. In other words, this is basically the tangent space all around this, this circle or the sphere. It's an in-sphere, essentially, mm -hmm. if you, even if you wanted to call it four-dimensional space, five-dimensional right. space, it's still an in-sphere, uh, that, that these things occupy. And the best you can do is, is understand that well, there's stuff in here, and then there's stuff beyond that, and that's really all we can differentiate. And things in here, we kind of have some notion as to how close we are, right? Mm. Uh, but, like I was saying, that naturally induces a metric space, where if you, in, inside, of this, inside of this sort of larger space, and I'll, I'll make it smaller over here, mm. now we're in a situation where to, to create path dependence between between all of these things, we have to circumnavigate in this very particular way, uh, where this is always what I can see at any. These are the different time. emitters, right? Right, and and so this is this is what I'm capable of understanding. And so um, I don't know if you ever read uh, uh, Embassy Town, Embassy Bill, mm -mm. Embassy Town. Okay, so one of the things that uh, that Chena Miaville goes into is this notion of Ember Space, and Ember Space has this sort of I don't know, it's got sort of a similar valence to what mm. you're talking about, basically. But the important thing is that because it's such an unreliable thing to try to navigate, mm. they have to create beacons yes. uh, every yes. once in a while mm -hmm. uh, that everybody can come back to and try to find. And so every time somebody goes out to inner space and just tries to be a damn fool and find some new area, uh, they're probably going to die. But in the event <laughs> that they don't die, they're going to create a beacon and they're going to especially mark off areas that are particularly dangerous because they go off into some area mm -hmm. that they can't come back from. And this is kind of the same thing you would have to do here in terms of navigation, unless, unless in that, in that particular situation where you are 
you are in this vast. Oh, sorry. Uh, you're in this vast kind of. Oh, Jesus. It's not working very well. Don't worry about it. Uh, you're in this vast <laughs> kind of sea, and uh, and you have this situation in in which um, you you've got your little little bubble thing here, and uh, you need to be able to translate uh, something like uh, gravity waves um, into this this space that you end up in out here. And, uh, and at that point, then, the, the question becomes, um, what do they translate into? What I would put to you, then, is that because gravity waves can be so damn subtle, and because we often need two massive black holes to be able to spin into each other and merge before mm -hmm. we even notice the damn things, it might be better to just go ahead and, and imagine a way in which gravity waves, by the time they come out here, translate into some new phenomenon, mm. essentially, mm. right? Um, which, which sounds like a cheap out, but I just wonder if it might not be better to... Well, to, to try to explain away the extremely small amplitudes of the waves that you're dealing with, uh, by by converting them into something else in this other space, which only makes sense to me because I would expect that in this other space, gravity waves map into some other thing, some other right. phenomenon, right? So so okay, so so here here's here's part of where I'm coming to this with is um, any object of interest in space is going to be a relatively massive object compared to the vastness of space, right? Mm, mm. So when you are navigating fugue space or, or quasi space, right? Anything that, that rocks the boat, anything that, that shifts the, the seas in which you, you navigate, it's not necessarily going to be what you want, but it is, it is a potential point of interest, right? Anything right. That, that causes the waves could potentially be something you want. Mm. Now, that's not to say it's universal, right? Maybe there's a tiny asteroid that's entirely made of gold or, you know, <laughs> to use uh, um, James Cameron, unobtainium. Yeah. Um, Jesus, yeah. There's, a, there, there's a small island of unobtainium that, that would be nigh undetectable until you are right on top of it. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, solar systems, stars, planets, these are the things that would be more broadly detectable as you get close to them and would be recognizable as such, mm. because while there is there is a um, there's a certain variance between the size of stars, generally speaking, that's one to two orders of magnitude. Sure. So it would be recognizable as such. You wouldn't you wouldn't conflate something that's a hundred meters wide with a star, right? You there, there's a certain expectation right. of an object of a certain size, right? Sure. Sure. So as you're sailing through quasi space. Um, by the very virtue of, of traveling through it, and because we, we're essentially condensing by many orders of magnitude the size of space, we're, we're contracting, you know, we're basically condensing a galaxy's worth of space into the size of the Pacific Ocean, mm -hmm. ideally, right? Such that this is something that is navigable on the scale of days, weeks, months, yeah. rather than years, decades, centuries. W which means the perception of gravity waves is going to be higher in frequency, um, closer together. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, and, and so, so the other part of this is, because we are dealing with an extra dimensional space, we can translate, we, we don't have to literally take gravity waves. We, it, this is an extrapolation of gravity waves. It, it, it's essentially, the, the only thing that's important is that um, when you are in quasi space, as you have the the, the surface of this sphere, right? right, you are experiencing something that is interacting with this surface, mm -hmm. right? All that is important is that there is an object that is that has some some kind of influence on this fluid space that you are in, right? And that's that's the the most important and biggest difference between quasi-space or, or fugue space right. with real space, which is that 
Whereas real space, yes, there are solar winds, but those are comparatively minute. Sure. And sure. space is, is a, a comparatively empty space. Yeah. Right, 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 right. <laughs> fair, 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 fair point. Fair point. Um, what we are proposing with with qua, with with fugue space or quasi space is that um, there is a, 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 a detectable fluid mechanism such that a star, the, I guess the the movement of a star, which happens in real space through just the natural movements of galactic bodies, sure. right? Because of the contraction in fugue space, where you know say it's, it's a ratio of one to a million, so that a comparatively small movement of a, spot of a star in real space, mm -hmm. in fugue space, would actually have a very dramatic effect. Right, right. And it's, it's causing churn, such that as, as you and your comparatively tiny little s the ship is sailing across, the churn of a star's movement, we can say either the movement itself or the emission of some kind of gravitic wave or comparatively gravitic wave right, right. Is, is detectable in a meaningful way so that th uh, it's enough that you can navigate by. Right. Uh, but so, so, so let, me, let me give you yeah, something continue, else please. Uh, to play with then. Um, so, so you're familiar with the two-slit experiment? Uh, 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 let's go, let's go over Tell me it. like I'm fine. Let, let's go over it. Uh, so, so, <laughs> So the, the double slit experiment is we have we have a screen, an impassable screen. We put two slits uh, two slits in it, and uh, and we shine a light um, on the on the on the two slits. Right. And the the important thing here is is that as the light moves, it's going to shift the. Uh, so so the important thing here is that even though. We have effectively um. light photons going at optical infinity, so they're effectively straight. Mind you, photons that are not at optical in infinity are effectively radiating out, but, but, but that's not the case here. After a, a certain amount of distance, they are effectively optical infinity, and that, what optical infinity means, right, in terms of the lens of our eyes or any lens whatsoever, is that the rays are effectively parallel, straight yeah. in the mm -hmm. parallel, right? Um, so, so the important thing here is that when we do this with a double slit, we, we have a second screen, which is our detector screen. And uh, so then we have this situation in which these, these waves are coming out of each of these slits and they interfere at some point and we actually see the interference pattern occur at the detector screen on the other end. So that ultimately what we end up having are these areas of um, interference in between areas of reinforcement, right? That is, that is what it means to have, and mind you, the amplitude sort of varies in this natural, obvious way um, where mm. it's, it's stronger in the center, weaker at the extents and so on. Right, so, so, so as a brief aside, so sure, you know, sure. we, we, we've got our little fugue bubble here, right? Mm -hmm. And we have waves impacting. Mm -hmm. Not only are we able to detect the impact of the waves themselves, mm -hmm. but we're also able to detect the intensity mm -hmm. with which the waves impact. Absolutely. So we're dealing, so the, the surface area mm -hmm. is a two-dimensional space. Right. And then once you add intensity, we're dealing with three-dimensional right. data. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. But the 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 amplitude of the waves will will tell you the the mass of the object, right? Basically, um, but but I'm not going that. Uh, okay, I'm not going Continue. there. Yeah. I, I think you'll find that this is wildly different. Um, so so you you have this you have this waveform pattern, right? And fair enough. And the the curious the curious part of, of the double slit experiment here um, that has has basically been the, the bane of, of quantum physicists uh, everywhere for, for decades now, is that you can do the same experiment with two slits. And this time, you're going to use a laser. And the laser, you are going to permit to emit a single photon at a time. You're going to... Um. You're going to tune it down, and mind you, I don't know if you're familiar with how lasers work, but 
but there is a partially silvered mirror on one side mm. and a full mirror on the other side and you you emit a, a photon into here and that photon hits the partially silvered mirror and then bounces back here and then goes back goes back goes back and until it hits sufficient intensity that it breaks through precisely it right it's through the partially partially silver mirror and is emitted uh, out the front in a very precise beam and the important thing here is that we use this laser we met a single photon and what happens is it's not a wave anymore actually it is. Fuck you. <laughs> That's the fucky thing about this. That's what's so completely bonkers about this nonsense is that by the time we get to the other end, uh, we actually still have the exact same fucking waveform. And you think, well, there's a one photon being emitted. And it goes through, eventually, it goes through one of these slits. Once we emit enough photons, there's got to be one that goes through one slit or mm -hmm. the other. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't get to the other side otherwise. And yet, we still have the same fucking interference pattern. What kind of crazy horse shit is that? It doesn't even make sense. But the, but the, the thing is, to, to, to see it stack up this way is you would, you, would get, you would get a register on your screen here, right? Mm -hmm. And you'd be like, oh, okay, there's one. Oh, oh, we got another hit over here. Oh, we got another hit over there. And then bit by it's bit. It's behaving in a waveform pattern. Slowly but surely, it would miss all the points in between in all these spaces where we would normally consider there to be interference. And yet, it's only one photon at a fucking time. What kind of nonsense is that? And the Copenhagen interpretation of this is to say that every individual photon carries with it information uh, that is effectively a waveform and and has has with it information sufficient to effectively interfere with all of the probabilities of where that photon might have gone but instead what ends up happening is that it reaches a point where it decoheres and then becomes this particular waveform pattern on the other on the other side which frankly I mean it sounds preposterous to anybody honestly but David Deutsch uh, has pointed out that that might actually just be complete nonsense, and we would be silly to think about it that way. Rather, instead, he points out that a much more physical interpretation of this is to say that with every photon, and the emission of which is accompanied by the emission of infinitely other photons, shadow photons in some sense, uh, all around it. Uh, well, shadow photons are, are hard to <laughs> hard to draw, but but let's let's say that they have empty empty, empty space silhouettes, inside, yes. and they're all coming out at the same time. And da what David Deutsch points out is that if we were to presume that there are an infinite number of possible ways this this photon could have popped out of the end of the laser then let's also go ahead and suppose that there are just an infinite number of shadow photons which represent all those possibilities mm. in all of these parallel universes, these mini worlds, right? This is the mini worlds interpretation. Uh, and the reason that the photon that we end up seeing at the other end of this detector screen uh, appears to interfere with itself or rather all of its potentialities is not because it's interfering with a bunch of abstract potentialities, but rather because it is being interfered with by an infinitude of shadow photons that end up jostling it into this interference pattern. Which is to say that the reason for all of these gaps is, is not because there's some magical abstraction that gets it there, but rather because there are an infinitude of shadow photons that produce the gaps themselves in the first place. Uh, 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 to put it another way, um, you have a photon, you have a ton of shadow photons, and if this photon hits anywhere over here, we can ask ourselves about uh, how many shadow photons might there be if we're going to presuppose this absurd notion of shadow mm. photons? Well, clearly, there has to be far more shadow photons than there are actual photons. Otherwise, we wouldn't have more gaps than not, essentially. Mm. 
which is why we can presuppose an infinitude of shadow photons uh, interfering, because that's, that's exactly the one thing that would ensure that a single photon only goes to one of a very tiny, finite number of places on this detector screen, essentially. So David Deutsch points out it probably is just as well that we would say, actually, there are just infinitely many universes that are, are deeply entangled at this particular event, and, and they all have their own photons, but in these other universes, in, uh, by uh, respect to our universe, they're effectively shadow photons that interfere with the one photon that we actually can see and, and interact with and observe. And, but they, because they're entangled, that means that that one photon still has this, this problem of hitting the detector screen in this waveform-like pattern, right? So we end up in a situation where rather than worrying about waves of this sort, what if we were to, what if we were to talk about uh, waves of these shadow photons in some sense? Basically, the shadow photons themselves are the things that effectively create the waves. They're like a, they're like a dual form of wave. It's like if the one photon is sort of this piece of wave, uh, then the thing that creates that wave is this multitude of shadow photons. And maybe there's an idea of writing a sea of shadow photons, essentially, that ends up instantiating wave-like things... Uh, that can be interpreted as waves, but simply just aren't, mm. basically. Um, my, my point being that this this could be slightly more convincing in the sense that you don't have to worry anymore about whatever amplitude the gravity waves are and superlinearity, which which prevents you being able to understand how far or how close the thing is. You wouldn't have to deal with any of that. You could start presupposing uh, uh, attributes of shadow photons from, from alternate universes that end up being the thing that you're effectively writing in some sense, or at least using mm. for circumnavigation. Um, yeah, anyway, that's, that's just... So, okay, so, so, so to follow through on this, from an experiential standpoint, assuming that I as an operator, you know... Here, I'm a guy, I've got a neural jack mm. that is providing me essentially perfect understanding of this detector screen. Mm. My experience of these as they come through, mm. um, would, this, would, this be a, would this be simultaneous? Or would there be, again, assuming perfect information, right, would right. there be uh, a detectable difference in the impact between real and shadow photons or I, is is there is this a means by with by which I could navigate, or is it is there a simultaneity here, whereby I'm simply just detecting the wave as a whole? Yeah, so that, that, that's a great question. Um, so with with the detector screen, you would absolutely the, at, at this point the detector screen is basically the, the the surface of the fugue bubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. So so at, at that point, then you absolutely can pick up on a particular waveform. The interesting thing about the detector screen is that you have zero information about where this thing came from. Yeah, all, all, all you have is the moment of impact. That's, that's exactly right, uh, which is sensible. Now, um, so, so when it comes to being able to detect one of these things, you, you do end up with a waveform. That waveform... Uh, does occur sort of, so to speak, one particle at a time over time, which means that you would in fact be able to discern the central point of contact with the surface from say, these other points of contact which occur subsequently thereafter. So you would have an amplitude distribution across the surface. In, in principle, you could actually do all of the th same things that you would want to do, I suppose. Uh, I, I guess that actually makes some sense ultimately. I, I, I suppose that the problem becomes um, how to how to escape this uh, this idea in terms of being related specifically to particular particles because again you're not getting photons in this space that's real matter that's that's mm. that's something that is verboten 
You're, 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 you're getting the energy interaction with the surface of the, of the sphere. Right, but, but, but even... Whatever that is. Yeah, but, but, but even then, it, <clears throat> it almost has to be... Uh, it almost has to be somehow uh, a step removed in, in some sense to, to be remarkable. So maybe gravity waves are still useful to that degree, but um, to, to the point I, I made earlier outside, I, I think maybe you should step outside of space time if you can. Right. And posit something that is just bonkers off the wall. Well, so, yeah, so, so that, that's um, the, the only thing that's important to us is, uh, right, so, so like, like metaphorically speaking, so we, we've, got, we've got the boat, we've got, we've got the boat on the seas, mm -hmm. right? We can't actually see waves that are coming towards the ship. All that we can see is the waves as they hit the surface area of the ship on the water. But we have perfect information of the waves as they hit. Right. Uh, beyond that, um, what we're dealing with is, or, or rather, from from a, a conceptualization standpoint and, and and from a creative standpoint, I don't need these to be gravitons. Right. All I need simply is that. Um, what is important in this world in, when navigating fugue space is that I can detect objects of mass. Mm. Now, what the relation of objects of mass with fugue space is, we can define. That is an open question. Right, right. And uh, that's simply like what, what, is, what is most of value to this space. And ultimately, I don't actually care what that relationship is. All that I care about is that that relationship, while we don't necessarily have to articulate that to the audience in an explicit way, from a creator standpoint, we need to understand a rule set for that. Because that's, that's something that's very important to me is I don't, ultimately, even if we don't necessarily articulate that, we need to understand it because I don't want this to be too hand wavy, right? Right. This needs right. to be a rational space that we can have a rule set by which we can define objects in space right. that then define how people navigate. Um, and, and of course, if there are consequences that arise naturally from this thing that you might not have even thought of, that can be but that that that's that the, can be useful narrative. Yes, way, absolutely. Th then that would be so much the better because it, it creates this concreteness. And, and, and yeah, so, so, so to bring that back to, um, ah, shit, uh, who's the guy, uh, chaos theory, um, Lawrence. Yeah. So, so to bring that back to Lawrence, the whole point is that we don't want to set out from the, from its inception to create an extraordinarily complicated system. Of course. Because the, the, that's, it's impossible to track that. Right, right. Both from a creative, you know, from all the different standpoints, what we want to do is create a logically extraordinarily simple system right. that then we can extrapolate right. more complex results and laws from, but ultimately can be distilled down to a handful of rules. Right. You have the picture on top, which is this yeah. notion of, of wayfinding in a vast sea with limited information, yeah. and you need that to actually interpolate rather yes. than extrapolate down into a theory that effectively creates yeah. this emergent thing. Yeah, so, so, so we can have these interesting situations of like when you are quote unquote sailing in a fugue space past a three body situation, right. that can have its own unique interactions based upon this simplistic rule set that then defines, you know, the, whatever creative situations we come up with, right? So, and, and from that, we can then engender specific stories or these types of things um, that feel real right. to both ourselves as creators and also to the audience because they are informed by a defined rule set. Because mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's the kind of thing that I rail against generally in, in sci-fi, but specifically s space opera sure, is, sure. And, and, and I'm going to... I'm not trying to make the Brigadier Universe explicitly hard sci-fi. No, 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 no. It's us. <laughs> I, I forget who said it. Um, we were talking in the Brigadier Discord, and someone defined it as turgid sci-fi. Ooh, uh, ooh. <laughs> I like it. Where, where it's, where it's, it is, yeah. is harder than space opera. That's right. But not as hard as hard sci-fi. Where it's, it is enough because, because that's, um, from a creative standpoint, and I, I know I, that's kind of my catchphrase, but. Uh, 
what we want to do here is create a rule set that while not entire, it doesn't necessarily have to be like perfectly articulable and grokkable by the audience. Sure. They need to at least be able to sense that there is a system right. that is in place here such that we as creators aren't just like throwing shit into the wind. Right. It is at least plausible that there is some expert out there somewhere who actually understands what the yes. fuck is going there, there, on. There is, there is a rationale and logistics behind yeah. this because that, that's kind of the definition of, of the whole, our intent behind the Brigadier of the Universe as a whole. We're not trying to say that, that all of these things in our universe are, are explicitly defined by a hard physical understanding, but that whatever that understanding is, there is a rule set behind it right. that can be understood, if not art, explicitly articulated, at least sensed, and then worked around. Right. And that's... And critically, there are no contradictions in this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, so okay, so, so to bring this all, all the way back around, the problems that we are trying to solve is... One, how do you navigate? Yeah. Two, how, um, how do we define a rule set by which uh, we prevent certain kind of genre and world-breaking situations? So, for example, uh, hyperspace ramming. Yeah. yeah. So, the whole, one of the biggest problems... You know, and I know you know this, but I just want to make Everywhere. it explicit. One Everywhere. of the biggest problems with any kind of hyperspace technology is if a thing, if an object is moving at the speed or past the speed of light, that is that is a weapon of mass destruction. And the one of the ideas behind the fugue bubble is that these objects, compared to real space, are not are not actually moving at any speed. They are simply moving through a metaspace and then they pop out. Now, so that that, that, that solves part of the problem. The other part of the problem is what happens if you try to exit fugue space mm -hmm. into matter that is in real space. Sure, sure. And so my, my initial hypothesis for how to solve this is simply that... Um, it's in, deadly. Well, <laughs> yes. That's, Fatal. <laughs> that's, that's, that's one version. So, so yeah, so, so, so the, the, the way that, that a lot of people handle this is, is, is telefragging, where it's like if, if you exit this meta space into real space mm. in concert with other pre-existing matter, then, and that's how Star Trek handled it, which is that you fuse to the mutual destruction of both. Right. But it's, it's not catastrophic in the way of like an atomic bomb. Right. It is simply, yeah. they get jammed together uh, and like, and like that's it. It's, it's relatively inert. Phil Philadelphia experiment style, you, you end up part of the thing and that yeah. might not be good for you, but eh. <laughs> yeah. um, well, the rest of us will live. <laughs> so, so, okay, so, so that's, that's, that's one possible solution sure, sure. to fugue space. Another that I've been leaning towards but haven't been able to properly articulate is this idea of, of kind of echoing the abscess of the fugue space bubble in the Okay, so I've got my ship, mm. and the ship has whatever the fugue drive is. Right. It it creates it creates this abscess in fugue space. Yeah. And we're detecting real mass, sure. right? And any mass creates any kind of wave. Now, potentially a single atom. Then, so like re reduce this down to its smallest components. A right. single atom would have a comparatively the tiniest possible wave. It, it'd be exceedingly small, sure. Um. So if we want to avoid the, the, the telefragging solution to this, then uh, the other solution is basically like uh, um, essentially pushing out of any matter. So like if you if you exit fugue space, so like say say we have a perfect cube mm. of gelatin, and I'm I'm in my fugue bubble and I'm traveling I'm trying to travel through this. Sure. And in media res, so I'm in the fugue equivalent of being in the middle of this giant cube of gelatin. I then exit fugue space. Rather than uh, commingling matter with the gelatin, I instead push out everything as I exit. Such that because I'm translocating whatever matter was brought into this bubble, mm. it then pushes out. The problem with this is that exiting that bubble 
if, if you do this, then there's a kind of infinite force with which that bubble projects. Right. Because say you say rather than gelatin, it's a cube of, of, of the hardest diamond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That then explodes this cube of diamond in a way that would be catastrophic. And the emission of energy, yeah. there, it wouldn't be conservation of energy. It would just explode. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So the other possible solution to that is simply that you cannot exit into matter. Mm -hmm. So uh, what that requires then is that rather than a bubble that actually has a large volume is that bubbles of any size, I guess in essence, only occupy a single atom of space or a quark of space, right? Um, such that they can't push anything, but they also can't exit into anything. They can only exit into a relative area of space that isn't already occupied. Right. Right. But I, I can't I can't I can't quite square that. Yeah, yeah. So the, the part of the part of the problem with that then is you almost need a, a kind of matter resistance essentially, mm. uh, like uh, trying to put two magnets of opposite poles mm -hmm. together. Essentially, there, there's that yeah. that pushing force. So, yeah. So 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 as an aside, so like, because because to 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 bring back to the whole soap bubble idea, right? As soon as you pop the soap bubble, everything falls back into water, right? Right. But that means that. Say I am, you know, either I simply can't travel across the cube of diamond, mm. or if I am in the middle of traveling across the cube of diamond, when I, if I suddenly exit the bubble, I get instantly displaced yeah. outside of that cube of diamond. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But, and that, that I think inherently isn't necessarily problematic, but there needs to be a kind of rule set for that such that as soon as you exit, so like, you know, writ large, say I'm, I'm in the equivalent space of a star, and then I exit the fugue bubble, you know, a bad, or not, not bad, but a, a, um, uh, a poorly resolved version of this is that you could exit inside the star and then the star explodes because the sudden, you know, right. and then we have, we return to the weapons of mass destruction problem. Yeah. Instead, you get displaced immediately outside the area of the star. Right. And then, of course, you get sucked into the star and you're fucked anyway. Um, but I don't, I don't know if that gels. Anyway, so continue. Oh, well, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So I was going to point out that, that maybe it's reasonable, actually, to, uh, as a matter of course, always, uh, if, you are, if you are a ship entering back into real space, mm -hmm. uh, it would, might be useful, as a matter of course, to always enter some massive body and then exit there with this particular mechanic because mm. because then that means that everybody who re-enters real space uh, has a a target velocity which is to say both a direction and a magnitude and you would want to exit in such a way perhaps that you're already well on your way to wherever it is you're going in real space and presumably you're not going to dip out of this this special space, uh, or this fugue space, special space, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's special. Uh, so, uh, pr presumably you're not going to dip out of fugue space, um, uh, and at some undetermined point, rather you're going to do it perhaps in a way that is navigable, which mm -hmm. is to say mm -hmm. that there are sufficiently massive bodies for you to be able to, to ascertain where you are. And then you're going to choose one of these massive bodies in particular, that is especially massive and is useful to, to get where you to, to where you want to be. Mm -hmm. So they act as they ultimately act as a kind of transport hub, essentially. So so sorry, are you proposing a kind of attractive quality of like when you exit, you're kind of pulled towards the nearest object of any mass? Uh, actually, the the reverse or the opposite. Sense. Okay, right. Like like if you if you if you are if you find yourself sort of poised over some massive body. And uh, the thing that happens between dropping from fugue space back into real space is that uh, every particle with gravity around you ends up shooting you off someplace mm. in this in this uh, sort of resistive way. Right. Then what you like, can like do, a magnet. Right. You yeah. can you can actually choose perhaps if you, with 
sufficient granularity and resolution. Where so you, you drop predict, that, okay, so you can inherit down. that velocity as you exit. And this becomes a useful mode of transportation, right? <laughs> Son of a and, bitch. and so once you've once you've accomplished that, then this becomes a natural transport hub. Moreover, different points of this of this star, for instance, end up becoming ways of going directly to you know, whatever particular planet over here or wherever over there, right. and you already have a natural velocity in real space that is potentially quite a bit higher and closer to speed of light than you might have been able right. to Right, so, so like a bubble rising to the surface. Precisely. The important thing here is that you don't go splat. Right. So you can't have real you come out too fast, you're... You, you can't, but, but I, I don't think you can have real acceleration at all in this case. Right. I don't think... You, you, you simply it. exit... Already at that speed, there is no acceleration. Exactly. The problem is the deceleration. That is much harder, which means... That's wonderful. Which means that there is a, a strict limit here because you're coming up so fucking fast that if you, if you want to hit this planet sitting over here, you have another natural halfway point, mm. another station out here where you're going to turn around and you're going to burn hard in the reverse direction as soon as you get, as you get into real space. And you're going to burn and burn and burn and burn and burn right. for a long time until you get way the fuck out here. And now maybe you've got three, the gravitational three, pull, maybe. And maybe you've got three months to get back to here. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. by the time you're in real space, this is still infinitely better than right. being able to uh, not being able to make a three month trip, but uh, you know, like a three, three week trip or yeah, 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 something ridiculous like that. So, so you can have a whole set of dynamics that are actually quite interesting uh, if you permit yourself that. Um, and that's a possibility. And I, I think this is actually, I wouldn't even worry about the, the physics of it. You know, th this is explainable in some space that doesn't... Right, exist. and I, I don't, I don't, we, we don't need to actually put out, like, equations. Right. It simply needs to be understandable yeah. in, a, yeah. in, a, in, a, you know, in a graspable way. Uh, and I, I have to admit, yeah. I, I, actually, I, I actually find this most plausible in terms of the, the collision aspect, mm -hmm. um, simply because it's, it's explainable, it doesn't lead to immediate destruction of anything and in fact the worst in the worst possible case you're going to be well the fucking way outside the bounds of right. anything you wanted to get to and in truth that means that there are real consequences for anybody who comes out a little too hard a little too fast potentially yeah, just... at the wrong body which yeah. is to say by the way we're never going to see you again you're going to die out here yeah and you, and, you're and, and, never going to be able to make it back. Even worse, you don't instantly die. You are fine when you come out, but you are moving at such velocity that you are irrecoverable. You're just going to die mm. in, in mm. trying to get back. Yeah. For, so you, well, welcome to the next 60 right. years of your life. You should probably commit suicide. Right. Which right. All also creates <laughs> a new culture of, of, uh, of maybe probably even a new piece of terminology for people who end up offing themselves because they, yeah, they, 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 they didn't close make burn the shot. or whatever. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. They didn't um, make the shot and now they're a lifer or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. Like, oh, he's, he's a lifer. You know, yeah. uh, he's, he's gone forever now because he's never going to be able to make it back. Right. He's just space trash. You yeah. Know? Um, okay. So, 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 so two things. I, I, I'm really liking where this is. Uh, so this, this, depending on the limits that we put upon this, right? True. So, so essentially, the you have to find some yeah. exactly. So essentially, the ejection speed, the potential ejection speed, yeah. is relative to the mass of the object. So the larger the object, yeah, yeah. the close, you know. So it's like assuming you are as close to center as possible mm -hmm. when you exit fugue. Mm -hmm. The larger the object, the higher the ejection speed. Right. You know, as the soap bubble rises to the surface. And, and I can I can even give you a, 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 a like a proportional equation, which is, is going to be you're going to have some gravity for this particular body, and there's going to be some some proportionality k, and between these two things, then you're going to find uh, you're going to find a k that allows you to eject at a rate that permits you to escape g. Yeah. Yeah. Is what it comes down. So to, yeah, right? you you have to. Uh, so so that means that you're also going to have a, a an initial velocity v essentially. Right. Um, so so between those those three things, you've got everything you need to decide. It, what it, it presumes to being able to escape the event horizon. Right. Right, and, and if we were talking about a black hole, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, now that is really those get real scary. That's really where it comes down yeah. to is how do we deal with black holes in particular. Well, the way that we should think about this is in this particular funny space, 
I'm gonna keep using. Silly, <laughs> I'm gonna keep using silly terms for all the work that you're doing. I'll I'll admit it. Okay, that's fine. So, so, so fair enough. So you're you're familiar with black holes, or are you yes. familiar with, with white holes? Only in the Vegas. Sense. Okay, so so I what, know that they exist. So a white hole is basically the exact opposite, and it's a, it's it's essentially the notion that you have a singularity, but then that singularity basically ends up spitting everything out, and so it is it is effectively a space in which nothing can enter. Mm. As opposed to nothing can escape. Right. Right. So, so the, they they have been supposed as a possibility, but black holes seem to be the only thing in, out in the universe. Mm. In the meantime, though, we can still posit these things as a possibility, and that allows us to at least think about these the, the these things conceptually, where we say, all right, well, if if something like a black hole, this ultimately supermassive body, mm. uh, ends up being something that we drop onto. Uh, then probably, depending on the size of the black hole, this is going to be the thing that surely more than anything else is going to spin us out halfway across the universe or something to that effect or halfway across the galaxy or whatever, what have you, whatever is convenient. So a white hole then would be actually the bane of our existence. If a white hole actually existed out there, by the time we go to drop into this thing, it's like all of a sudden a white hole, <laughs> we go into a white hole and now, unlike in real space... You get shot into it. That's exactly right, and then you can't get the fuck back out until you're effectively destroyed right. in some in some regard or some manner. Uh, so a white hole would basically be since it just the equivalent of a black hole, except in fugue space, where right. you if you drop out too close to white hole, right. you're and, in, and and, and, and and more importantly, it just sort of displaces you. <laughs> uh, right. So that that really would, that would sort of be conceptually the bane of your existence, whereas a black hole could potentially be, depending on the size of the thing, be this exceedingly useful. Uh, transportation hub, and maybe that's what your transportation hubs are not uh, not stars per se, but uh, but imploded that's stars it. that are right. actually black holes ultimately. Okay, so so two parts of this. One is and um, basically, so it would be okay if exiting in very close proximity to a black hole uh, exits you at relativistic speed because those are sufficiently rare. Yeah. And the calculation required, in a sense, in essence, to aim a projectile yeah. from a black hole yeah. would, would require such a feat as to be extraordinary. Right. So, like, that would be okay if right. it's a weapon. Otherwise, essentially, like, for example, exiting a star, um, that's where I, 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 I would need to just work with you to do the math such that, like, well, there's too many fucking stars for one thing, right? Right, but but so it's like exiting a star at sufficient speed to be valuable to get to where you need to go. Right. But is it so fast that it's enough to like be able to destroy cities, planets, etc.? Well, 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 but what if what if it was? That's exactly the problem that the expanse covered recently. Right? Mm. Is the fact that I can take yeah, a bunch of fucking brains. rocks right. and I can hide them from you and I can send them straight up at your fucking planet. And there's not a goddamn thing you can do about right. it. There's a real situation there. Um, and maybe what you have to do, the work that you have to do in the meantime, is not to eliminate the possibility of creating a weapon, but rather think through what did we do over the course or of the centuries to yeah. sort out how mm -hmm. to deal with this mm -hmm. obvious mm -hmm. and particular problem, right? Yeah. Uh, at which, you know, you, you can... Yeah. Go either way with that, but maybe that's the answer. Yeah, and then, so, so that's I don't necessarily want to prevent the the, the w, WMD issue here, rather right, 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 to right. simply be cognizant of it sure. and to be able to address it within the literature of the game. Yeah, it would be preferable or, if 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 yeah, everyone had probably. addressed the situation to a degree that is sufficient to to be to to be workable. Right. Right. So so in the event that you had some some black hole out there that everybody comes through and when everybody drops in it's such a supermassive black hole that everybody is flying at near, near the speed of light uh, right away but there happens to be like a space station over here you know rotating off uh, nearby to monitor the whole situation right you did well, get advance warning well and... the motherfucker who drops in here there is no warning so what you need to do is you need to either say something like space stations have to be thus so far away so that they have some means of being able to deal with this problem mm -hmm. um okay but but then it gets worse right so, <laughs> so 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 we need to think about this because right because the fact is the speed of light hue is not the speed of photons and you can't see when it's coming at you. That's right. Yeah. Because the, Blue the, speed ship, of, red ship. The, the, the speed of light in particular is actually the speed of causality. 
in our universe. That, that's what the speed of light is about. It's not about the speed of photons, it's about the speed of causality, which means that if, if you are a space station nearby, the fact of the matter is, there is no way that you can possibly detect something that can't possibly have happened yet, right? right. That's the whole point. So if you have something that's moving at relativ uh, relativistic speeds, then clearly, by the time causality catches up, it's already way too fucking late. There would have to be some kind of magical space technology that that they would have available to them right. to be able to deal with this, and then some kind of uh, some kind of countermeasure. Yeah, or 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 essentially, we we put a hard limit on how fast you can exit. So, like in an ideal situation, so mm -hmm. say you exit as close as possible to the center of a black hole, right, right. and the Fastest possible speed is still like one ten thousandth the yeah, speed of yeah, light. Yeah, yeah, like one half or one one thousand. Because because or something because like the, that. The, yeah. the 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 breadth of the transit is still done in fugue space. Absolutely. So yeah. we're we're already circumventing the broadest strokes. That's right. Of FTL. That's exactly right. Um, the uh, okay. So uh, that I guess my po my point to you then is all you need to do is find the K that fits your narrative. Right. Such that all of these issues can be addressed. Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Um, that's exactly right. Yeah, e either that it can't be of such destructive power that it ruins the universe, or right. that there are sufficient countermeasures such as to, to deal with it. Precisely. Precisely. Okay, so that's that is one one possible solution. Yeah, but and I, th I I think that's. I guess my point to you is, is is that I don't know how to square the circle, but right. it seems like there's is probably squarable. a way yes. to square the circle. Yeah. So, okay. So the one alternative to this that I would posit, and that I want to work with you with you, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. call it a night because it's late. Yeah, great. <laughs> fair, fair, fair enough. <laughs> um, so rather than the, the soap bubble rising to the surface sure. hypothesis, so we, we'll just call this the soap bubble hypothesis. I'm down. Um, the other possibility is simply that uh, while real matter okay so so like our, our whole supposition for fugue, fugue space traversal is that objects of mass exert some kind of force uh, waves or whatever they are right. and the larger the mass the greater the, the force sure. such as to be both detectable and a means of movement right. as well right um that that i think is, is is pretty core to whatever our hypothesis for this whole situation is okay um but as a alternative to the soap bubble hypothesis um if we instead say that objects of mass while they can exert waves or exert force into fugue space if objects of mass themselves are an absence from fugue space. So, you know, let me, let me erase this real quick. Um, so, okay, so say we have, we've, we've got, you know, the solar system, right? Well, we've got a star at the center, and we've got little planets in orbit mm -hmm. around. Um, the fugue space equivalent of this is we would have um, this is a contracted space, right? Because so fugue space is at, at some fraction, fractional proportion of real space. Mm -hmm. So it's this tiny little box equivalent. Right. If objects of, if, if mass itself doesn't actually exist in fugue space, it is an absence in it. So it would be the equivalent, no matter how large an object is, its equivalence in fugue space would be a dot of infinitely small size. Mm -hmm. So instead, we have these, you know, a solar system of a, of a star with three bodies. Right. As you're navigating through, is instead four dots. Now, those dots are emitting waves of size relative to their mass, but they are dots. Right. That means that in an infinitely small dot, you can't actually exit into a dot. Mm. You would, at best, so say you, you know, you're traveling in a line and there's a dot here, and if you exit at the exact moment of that dot, you're still adjacent at best. Mm, mm, mm. So if matter in its entirety is absent from fugue space, then you literally cannot exit fugue space into other matter. Yeah. We avoid 
the soap bubble issue entirely and in essence matter exerts influence on fugue space but you cannot cross contaminate you can never exit fugue space into matter which from a soap bubble standpoint so say there's a, a hypermassive star or a, a you know a black hole from the fugue space standpoint it would emit these massive waves, but if you perfectly navigated through those waves, mm. ultimately you'd be navigating towards an infinitely small point that you can never actually reach. No, that's Zeno's paradox. That's not true. Okay, so maybe you could reach it, but then if you tried to exit at that exact point, the basically the rule that would make this work is that you can't actually exit at the exact dot. You would simply, in the perfect execution, you would exit tangent. Right, but but in fairness, though, Hugh, mm. the, your if if this is your fugue space and you're coming closer and closer and closer and closer to this to this infinitesimal point, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas here in real space, you're coming closer and closer and closer and closer to the center of gravity, mm. right there. Um, I can, you can. You can give me a, uh, I, I should say, if, if, if you give me a, uh, you know, a point here mm. in fugue space uh, that is outside of, of the center of gravity, it doesn't line up. I can give you a point that is closer in fugue space that is closer to the center oh, of gravity. Okay. Do you see what I mean? Mm. So, so from a, a calculus standpoint, I can always find you an epsilon to your delta, which means that at some point, if if this is a non-zero radius, I will be able to cross this boundary no matter what. Mm. I can always find an epsilon for your delta um, that, that gets me there, mm. right? Um, so that might not actually be sufficient. Uh, another thing uh, that I, I, a little conundrum that I want to put to you is mm. that this notion of having everything suddenly shrink and become much smaller one of the things that you run into is what is the relative size of these ships because they need to be able to all be able to occupy the same space potentially so many at a time, mm -hmm. which is worth considering, which, which may, may be a fun thing. Yeah, to can sort can they collide, etc. Right. Um, but then, but then on top of that, if we're talking about uh, about these things having these oversize uh, effects in fugue space, well. There is no such thing as empty space. From, mm. a, from a quantum standpoint, you always have non-empty space. It's what we call, uh, 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 it's, the, the, the word for it really would be the quantum jitters, is essentially what we, <laughs> we, we typically call it, right? Mm. Um, uh, or another way to look at it is quantum foam. It's because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle where, where if you have empty point space, and you have a field across that empty point space, then because we're so damn certain of the locations of all the points in that space, the one thing that we can't be certain of in the least is the, the momenta of those points, right? Mm. Which means that they're constantly going all over the fucking place, basically. And, and that creates this statistical anomaly where all of a sudden we have virtual particles popping up. The way that this is, is uh, demonstrated in string theory is if you have a uh, if you have an event horizon around a black hole, mm. the the to zoom in on that black hole is to see that this thing is actually just a, a roiling crazy mess. And the way the string theorists have described this as being basically a giant ball of string that is just completely wound up and going all over the place. And the way that they describe this quantum foam is they say that the that this string going all over the place like this uh, basically ends up in a situation where sometimes the string crosses itself and then in the in the next step this this ends up separating in a way and when that happens and this becomes a closed loop of string separate from the rest this is actually a particle. It's it's called a virtual particle. It's not it's not your typical particle, and it tends it tends to uh, evaporate very quickly in mm. some sense. But this virtual particle still temporarily has mass, has energy, 
uh, has its own reality, but these virtual particles are constantly erupting throughout all mm. of the vacuum. And, and that's the difference between the quantum jitters and the thermal jitters. Thermal jitters are things like being close to a star and then having your skin burn off because everything is so active, mm. right? Whereas quantum jitters uh, are exceedingly violent in vacuum space, and yet we don't experience those as being mm. violent in the, in the same sense. Normal matter okay. doesn't really encounter that. So, so it's, it's important to understand that there is still... Um, there are still point fluctuations in gravity because there are point fluctuations in mass happening even in the vacuum mm. at all times. Okay. So, so um, basically, okay, I guess my follow-up question then is, is there a possibility to make the, um, I guess, the, the, the zero volume idea as opposed to the soap bubble, right. the zero volume hypothesis? Is there a way to make the zero volume relation between real space and fugue space work? Where it's like, what would require this to work is that any object, no matter what its size and it, what its mass, so a single atom all the way up to a hypermassive black hole. Right. In fugue space, that emits distortions. It affects fugue space, right. but it itself does not occupy volume in fugue space mm -hmm. such that it is impossible to exit from fugue space into other mass. Right. Is there a way to square that? Yeah, maybe. Um, so, so maybe the thing that you have to do is you have to say that by definition, um, any time there is... Uh, non-virtual mass, uh, non-virtually created gravity, that somehow this is still always within the point, um, what, what, whatever that happens to be. Because, because again, the only way to avoid this delta epsilon problem is to say that by definition, uh, wherever we find mass, that's part of the point. You know? mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, mm -hmm. I can always find some place that right. is within the mass, but but uh, well, yeah, so so, so even even with the ejection though, right? So like, so say we have a star, and and we're we're talking about this this mass ejection that's happening. Mm -hmm. All of these points relative to the star are all essentially zero spaces. Mm -hmm. So from from the perspective of fugue space, these you know these these ejections are emitting uh, relatively infinitely tiny waves. Right. So, so there is a detectable aspect to it, sure, sure. but you still cannot exit into them. Yeah, they are simply they are ab not abscesses is the wrong word. They are absences from from that space, such that like essentially, if I'm flying across the trajectory of a black hole, mm -hmm. I, as soon as I encounter mass, I essentially skip across it. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that would happen with any matter. So. A single atom along this course, I skip across a single atom. But when I hit the entirety of a star, I skip across the entirety of the star. The problem with this idea is that there's space between atoms. Well, that's, yeah, I was about to <laughs> put out the so so so, yeah. so you, you we would have to extrapolate some kind of like you know the atomic force or like something there such that we can understand mass in in a kind of physical world understanding of mass as opposed to a physics understanding of mass right, where right. the majority of mass is empty space. And I don't yeah. know how to square that. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's just it is uh, even with uh, subatomic particles, you're going to run into the same problem because some of those have mass too. Right. And, uh, you know, what, what if you... What if you ended up in a cloud of neutrinos, which... Do you just get ejected like 100,000 light years? Yeah, you yeah. Know? I, mean, I mean, that seems unlikely, but it's worth considering because some asshole is going to ask you, hey, what happens if you hop, exactly. hop into a cloud of neutrinos? And, and so, so we, have to, we either have to square that by, by doing ejection, right. which, which is a problem because then you are exerting energy yeah. as you exit. Yeah. Uh, okay, so so either well, I mean, you can well, kind of you can the way that you can kind of think about this is that I mean, if if, if this is your if this is your sea that you're buoyed upon, then um, then an extremely massive body creates a, a kind of maelstrom here, right? Mm -hmm. And and so what ends up happening is that you is that as you dive 
down into the, you know, what is kind of like a, a really insane gravity well in some sense, you're already going to come out running, uh, basically, mm. you know, um, which, which kind of makes a certain sort of sense. Like in our transition uh, from this curious space into, let's see, I used a different word again, <laughs> in, 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 into, in, space. In, into, yeah. into real space. Um, you have a kind of momentum that, that goes along with that. And so, you know, I think there's a, a natural way to describe this velocity that would even work anecdotally from a character's mouth, essentially, um, mm. which makes some sense. Whereas I think it's going to be much harder to square the circle trying to talk about gaps between subatomic particles right. and explaining why it should make any sense at all that you can avoid all of that. So, so, so to kind of close this out, so more broadly speaking, uh, um, the, the, the weapon of mass destruction problem yeah. is essentially expellent force. Yeah, and I feel like you've avoided that, that, that problem by using that, that particular situation. Mm -hmm. the, the WMD problem already... So, yeah, so, it's like, so essentially, if, if, we do, if we do the... Um, I forget what, I came up, what the name I came up for this was. Uh, not the soap bubble theory, but um, the, the avoidance, um, avoiding matter idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll refer back to this later. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh, this idea that... So in, in your case of the nebula... Uh, w essentially what that would inform then is that you literally cannot exit fugue space into a nebula. Nebula themselves would essentially become these, these shoals mm. of non-fugable space. They, they would be, you know, f uh, from the perspective of fugue, they would still be dots, right? Mm. You would only be able to detect them through the waves that they emit, but you would never be able to exit into a nebula. But relatively speaking, a nebula is this hypermassive volume of space right, right. that then, in, a, in essence, becomes a kind of refuge because no one can possibly exit directly into the nebula. They can only exit into a non-mass occupied space at the edge of the nebula. Or they have a vehicle of sufficiently small size that can essentially thread the needle mm. of all the particulate within the nebula such that it can exit within within it. Yeah, so, so you, going back to uh, using black holes as these kinds of transport hubs, if this is reasonable, then there should be really no problem of dropping into a nebula. Mm. I guess, um, you know, I can imagine if, if black holes do this this work of causing you to do a hard burn in the Yes, yeah, so, so doing the soap bubble, yeah. Uh, uh, for a little while, um, and it's up to you to decide how long that burn has to be and how hard, um, then, and frankly, it needs to be not so hard that it kills everybody on board, right? right? So, so whatever the, the amount of time it takes at the maximum burn. And there's also presumptions of like how powerful the engines in this universe, right? Chemical, atomic, etc. Right. But although in fairness, let's be honest, you can probably concoct engines that would obviously be able to kill anybody for a lengthy hard burn. Right. So really your critical thing is to say this is what a human body can sustain and for so long right. and so our burn needs to be able to be this long at max at this acceleration right. and so on but but if that's the case and if your transport hub is a a you know potentially a supermassive black hole then anything substantially smaller including up to and including a very tiny black hole is not going to have that much effect. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, we can have a black hole right in between you and I right now, the size of, the, of a mote of dust, and we just wouldn't fucking notice. Right. Because it would va evaporate so quickly. Yeah, because the, 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 the K-very, yeah. yeah it's... Um, and so, so the same sort of thing applies here, and if, if all you're talking about with a nebula is just the fact that there's a bunch of stars there, well, well, their masses could be substantially larger than most other objects you would find, but what I would expect is that the danger of dropping into a nebula is not necessarily that you can't do it, but rather because there are so many point masses and they have so many You end up with effects, an unpre unpredictable trajectory an velocity. Unpredictable trajectory. And so you don't know where you're going to fly off to. And because you need to get back to some place that has right. water and air and all these things. So they, they be become real scary dangerous. risky places. Yeah. So, so I, I think the effect is the same, mm. but perhaps mm. for different reasons, mm. Uh, mm. ultimately. 
Um, and it's and it's worth contemplating all of those effects. Right. But uh, but that, that's how I would expect that to, to sort of settle right. down ultimately. I, I guess the other if if we stick with the soap bubble hypothesis, mm. it's so far I think is I, I, say, I think might be your best bet. Right. Maybe the the other solution to the weapon of mass destruction issue is that essentially, and this is already proportional a proportional relationship anyway, right. which is that the closer you exit to the center, the higher velocity. Yeah. Yes, and also the the, the less uh, predictable. Well, exactly. So that, that's what I was getting to is right. the more minute changes yeah. have dramatic impact on your trajectory. This is Such chaos that again, right? If, if yeah. we essentially state that in order to hit a velocity that is sufficient to have mass destruction scale impact for a vessel the size of a normal ship, sure. you know, um, it is so improbable to be able to predict the exit trajectory right. as to be rendered virtually impossible. Yeah, but, but let's, be, let's be clear about this though, Q. Uh, in fairness, th it's a matter of degrees, right? If I come off of this thing and I hit a space station, and it's, it's, no, yeah, it's, it's, that's, going that's still going to blow up. Yeah. You know, it's, everybody's dead. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not worried about being able to destroy a city. I mean, I'm, I'm talking worried about, about like, you're talking about world kill planetary. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I get that completely, but let's be honest. It's a matter of degrees and, yes. and it's for you to decide what is again, acceptable within the context what of that. This thing is, uh, that is the degree effectively right. that allows. So and, and, and this is, and that's the thing is like, this is this is already a fictional, and again, we don't not to belabor this too much. This is already a fictional universe where we do have some form of anti gravity sure. that a is enabling the fuse space. B, we have mass drivers mm. and we have shielding tech yeah. of of some form. So now you just need a good narrative that that brings all of these things together in such a right. way that you can have countermeasures, you can have ways of navigating yes. these things. We we have we have shielding tech that is sufficiently under certain circumstances, is sufficiently strong to be able to deflect a shot from a, a railgun, from a mass driver, oh, right? Wow, okay. Now, that's not, you know, relative mass of the mass driver, relative velocity, etc. cetera. Still, you know, I mean, we're talking railguns. It's... But it's, you know, so, so there are potential solutions to the problem. We simply just need to investigate what is the, the tolerance for this. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be ironclad. It simply needs to be enough that it can carry the weight of this IP right. without it breaking down with a, uh, you know, I don't want any Haldo maneuvers. Yeah, yeah, uh. <laughs> yeah. Well, let, 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 let's be fair then. Uh, probably coming off of this thing, whatever it happens to be at relativistic speeds is probably not a good idea. Right. Um, on the other hand, it it is at least reasonable to consider the possibility of coming off of a body somewhere Mm -hmm. at relativistic speeds. And so in that case, maybe there is room for some singular place that nobody dare tread, and that could be useful for storytelling later. Yeah, crazy places and also like insane space trash where it's yeah. like someone fucked up, they exited too close to a star, yep. they're moving at relativistic speed. Yep. And and that is that is a kind of, you know, black swan, right. insane space incidents. Right. You know, these kinds of things where it's like, it is a reason to have to, to have dragons in the sea. Yeah, worthy of here be dragons. Worthy yeah. of rumors and storytelling, but but not the sort of thing yeah. that we want to make awesome. Uh, typical. Okay. By I, will, by, I will. I will. I, I agree. I, agree. I will contemplate this on the tree of woe. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you have you have much to think <laughs> about, my friend. Uh, you know, in fairness, all I have to do is is tell you what reality can support and what can't, and what it can't support. It's, it's the nature of our relationship, and, frankly. And, and you have to. <laughs> <laughs> Are, are, are you good with me sharing this with the guys? Yeah, please. Okay. My God, I, I'm not. I'm not giving you anything that. Uh, that uh, well, you're you're you're, would, you're so. doing you're doing work here, so we'll we'll, we'll credit you with uh, when when the the appellations come and when we <laughs> make our inevitable millions and, and have the, the, the you know Hollywood adaptations well, that are, are inevitably butchered. Yeah, we're right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, fair enough.